Some 2,000 years ago, an obscure Jewish peasant from a remote country village was led outside the gates of the city of Jerusalem and executed by Roman officials by means of crucifixion, the most painful, shameful, and brutal form of execution ever devised by human beings. It was so brutal, in fact, that even though they made constant and very shrewd use of it, Rome denied ever having invented it. Nonetheless, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ and his subsequent resurrection from the dead a few days later have continued to captivate billions of hearts and lives and to transform the spiritual, moral, and social landscape of the entire world. Today is Good Friday. Today, we don't just commemorate a stirring symbol of sacrificial love. We make contact with an historical event that continues to send shockwaves throughout our lives and throughout the whole world. Today, we don't just say nice things about Jesus. We worship him. This is Good Friday. Welcome to worship. to worship from Hebrews 10. Since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened up for us through his body, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith. Amen. The word of the Lord.
chapter 19, verse 1 through 6. Then Pilato took Jesus and flogged him, and the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and arrayed him in a purple robe. They came up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and struck him with their hands. Pilato went out again and said to them, See, I am bringing him out to you, that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilato said to them, Behold the man! When the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cry, cried out, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilato said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. Behold the man. Behold the man. These are the words of Pilate speaking of Jesus Christ to the Jews. Now, before we get into what that phrase means, behold the man, I think it's important for us to take a step back and actually just go a chapter before. Uh, let us get our bearings in this narrative and understand what exactly is going on here. In John chapter 18, uh, we open that chapter by seeing Jesus Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane arrested by Roman soldiers. Uh, Jesus Christ uh, has been uh, betrayed by one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot. Having been arrested, Jesus Christ is taken to the high priest to be questioned and examined. As Jesus Christ is being examined uh, by the high priest, another of his disciples, Peter, denies him. In the courtyard, uh, strangers around uh, spot Peter and say, wait a second, aren't you a disciple of Jesus Christ? And, and Peter says, I don't, I don't know this man. I do not know. I, better yet, actually, I cannot identify this man. Peter denies Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ has been betrayed by one disciple and has also been denied by another. Having uh, been examined and questioned by the high priest, Jesus Christ is presented to Pilate. And Pilate does his own questioning, his own examination, and says, I cannot find any fault in this man. Uh, let it be to you, the Jews, to decide what to do with him. And the Jews say, no, he, he needs to be prosecuted under Roman law. And so Pilate reminds them, don't you have a, a, a rule within the Passover that says, you know, one of your uh, accused will be let go? And they say, yes, we do, but we don't want Jesus to be let go. We will choose Barabbas instead. But Jesus will be accused and will be prosecuted because we seek his death. And so here in John chapter 19, verse 1 to 5, what we find is Pilate's second attempt to have Jesus Christ released. His first attempt has is, is not gone well. And so he, he says, maybe if I appeal to their uh, pity, if I appeal to their compassion, um, if I flog him, if I, if I make Jesus Christ suffer a bit, uh, the, the Jews will see that and say, okay, he suffered uh, and, and we, we have what we need and we can let him go. We actually know this from Luke's account of this narrative in Luke chapter 23. So Pilate has Jesus flogged. Jesus is flogged and that means that he's severely beaten. It's not just a, a, a light beating. Uh, he's whipped and the whip itself is a large one that has multiple extensions and each extension has fragments of glass, fragments of bone, fragments of sharp metal. So it's not just a, a, a mere whipping, but the design of the whip itself is that it, it claws its way into the flesh, it tears the flesh and, and, it, and it rips out the skin, rips out the flesh such that Jesus Christ is not just bloodied, but he's bruised and he's battered. He's beaten severely. So Pilate uh, uh, takes the flogged Jesus 
and places a crown of thorns on his head. Now, this crown of thorns is not so much an instrument of brutality the same way uh, the flogging would have been, um, but it was more so an instrument of mockery. Look at the one who, 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 who claims to be king. Look at him with a crown of thorns. And so it makes sense actually then that uh, a purple robe is placed on the body of Jesus Christ. Purple being a symbol, colour of, of royalty. The picture here is one of mockery. The bloodied and bruised has now been mocked. And so Pilate presents Jesus Christ, bloodied and bruised, mocked before the Jews and says, Behold the man. Behold the man. Now, what does Pilate mean by that? Well, at least two things are been insinuated by Pilate himself. First of all, uh, Pilate simply means that here is the one who is accused. Behold the man. This is the person in question. This is the accused. But he also means uh, specifically to the Jews because he cannot understand why the Jews seek uh, to, to prosecute Jesus Christ so hard. Um, he, he means, look at, look at the one that you say is so dangerous and so uh, uh, troubling, um, so threatening. Look at him, bloodied, bruised. Uh, being mocked right now. Is this the one for whom you think is a threat? Behold the man, the one you find so dangerous, bloodied and bruised. In the Gospel of John, uh, this phrase, behold the man, is um, actually, a, in, in a deeper sense, a double entendre. So Pilate means one thing, um, but what we find in this narrative is that Pilate is saying more than he realizes because he isn't merely identifying Jesus Christ as the accused, nor is he uh, uh, speaking to the absurd threats that the Jews feel in the presence of Jesus Christ, but he's also quite literally identifying Jesus Christ. Behold the man. This is Jesus Christ. The one who is God who entered our world and entered flesh and blood. Here is ideal humanity presented before the world. The one who is being accused is the one who entered this world and lived a perfect life without any sin. The one who is being mocked is the one who went about healing, went about casting out demons, went about bringing peace. The one who is accused is a picture of humanity perfected. Humanity as it ought to be. And yet he's the one who is accused by humanity that is less than ideal. The Jews represent all of us who stand before Jesus Christ less than ideal and yet accusing the ideal man. Jesus Christ as the ideal humanity uh, stands accused before us. And what we see when, G when, when Pilate says, behold the man, is that we are being pointed to the one who has taken the accusation on our behalf. The one who should have been let go is now condemned. And us who should be condemned stand and watch. Jesus Christ is the one who uh, takes upon our sufferings, quite literally takes upon our floggings, uh, who takes upon the crown of thorns that we should have received. Jesus Christ is the one who has suffered on our behalf and has received the accusation for us. This is the meaning of Good Friday. The one who represents true humanity takes upon the accusation, the condemnation of all of us. Behold the man. True humanity for us who are less than ideal. And we can look upon him and see our redemption. Behold the man. Thanks for joining us for this good Friday evening service. Um, let's consider together 
how deep and amazing Christ's love for us is that even though the cost was great for him, his love for us was greater. So join me in this moment of confession. We'll say this confession together, and then we'll spend a few moments reflecting as Ryan plays for us. Lord Jesus Christ, though being in the very nature God, when you came to redeem us, you humbled yourself and made yourself nothing. Though you were rich, for our sakes you made yourself poor, so that through your poverty we might become rich. We confess how unlike you we are in our attitudes and actions. We strive for recognition from others, and we sulk and become bitter if I do not get it. We attend to our own needs and concerns, yet fail to care for others, except when it serves our purposes. Forgive us our sin and renew our hearts. Grant us to realize that we only achieve greatness and gain our lives by giving them away. Work in us by the power of your Spirit so that we become more like you. And so bring glory to our Father in heaven. Amen.
John chapter 18, verse 36 through 37, chapter 19, verse 12 through 16. Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not of the world. Then Pilato said to him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born. And for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. From then on, Pilato sought to release him. But the Druze cried out, If you release this man, you are not Kaiser's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Kaiser. So when Pilato heard these words, he brought out Jesus and sat down on the judgment seat at a place called the Stone Pavement, and in Aramaic, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of the preparation of the Passover. It was about the sixth hour. He said to the Jews, Behold your king! They cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilato said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, we have no king but Kaiser. So he delivered him over to them to be crucified. Almost certainly when Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor, gave audience that Friday to adjudicate a case before a rowdy Jewish mob, his sole motivation was to do as little political damage as possible. He didn't care about the cosmic consequences of the day. He just wanted to quiet the crowd and keep his name out of any career-ending rumors that might get to the emperor. And when he paraded Jesus before the crowd and mockingly declared, Behold your king! Pilate had no idea that he was disturbing a chord that had resonated in the heart of the Jewish people since their beginning. Nearly 2,000 years earlier, God had made a covenant with their forefather, Abraham, that Abraham's descendants would be the people of God, and God would provide for and protect them. And he had. The nation of Israel had grown and flourished as a nation tribe. God had ruled them faithfully, even when they had strayed. For centuries, God governed his people through men and women called prophets, who communicated between God and the people. And one of these prophets was named Samuel. God had spoken to and through Samuel for all of his life. But when Samuel grew old, the people came to him and said, this isn't working for us anymore. We don't want to be ruled by God. We want to make our own choice. We want you to find us a king. Well, Samuel was stunned. He didn't know what to say. So he prayed. And God answered by saying, Samuel, the people have not rejected you. They have rejected me as being king over them. So listen to their demand. But warn them, seriously, what it will be like when they no longer honor me as king. And so Samuel solemnly warned the people, look, this isn't going to turn out like you think. But the people said, no, we demand a king. We want to be like all the other nations so that our king will fight and save us from our enemies. So God said, give them a king. Well, no surprise, God was right. Centuries of kings rose and fell dividing and destroying the kingdom he had created. And the ironic tragedy was that the very thing the people had sought to be saved from was what they fell victim to. 
Over and over, they were occupied and oppressed by every self-proclaimed ruler riding their way. And most recently to our scripture today, they were being ground under the boot heel of Rome. But now, let's take a pause here. The essential difference between God's original plan and the people's demand was that they didn't trust God. They wanted to be in charge. They didn't want a king to rule over them. They just wanted a hero to be on call for when and where they wanted to be saved. Well, they got their way, but they didn't get what they wanted. And so we arrive on that Friday at the palace of Pilate. The Exodus Jews had rejected God as king, and now their descendants were about to do the same. As Jesus stood before his people in a crown of thorns and a bloody borrowed robe, they didn't see a savior. Here was God in the flesh revealing the extent of his love for them, that he would die for them. But like their ancestors, they just wanted a hero. They just wanted a modern-day Moses who would rip open the heavens and summon legions of angels who would grind their adversaries into the dust. They had hung their hopes on Jesus, and he had let them down. How dare this man pretend to be the son of God? He had even claimed to be a king. My kingdom this and my kingdom that. He had even said who would be able to enter his kingdom and who would not. But what good had it done them? He had not freed them or saved them. And here they were, still having to come before a Roman, even to punish the man they now saw as not merely a pretender, not just useless, but actually evil. This man must be crucified. So when Pilate gave them the choice, they knew what they wanted. Crucify him. We have no king but Caesar. Better the devil you know than the God you will not recognize. Jesus had told them over and over about his kingdom, but the people weren't listening. They refused to understand. It had never occurred to them that their savior might choose to suffer, that their sovereign might become a servant. They had designed the job description for their king and they weren't having Jesus any other way. They simply refused to come down from the throne and honor God as king. On that Friday, again, the people got their way. But thank God, it didn't turn out like they thought. And so here we are, nearly 2,000 years after that first Good Friday, but still with the same existential dilemma. What will we do with Jesus, who is called the Christ? That's a big question for all of us, and for each of us individually. Oh, we don't face the same enemies and oppressors as they did back then, but we still have battles to fight. We have to make a living in this world. Get along. Find a friend. And we have our secret weaknesses, fears and failures, addictions and aversions, losses. Every one of us has been ground down trying to take on all of that alone, to be our own hero. And we have the battle scars to prove it. Lives with hardened edges and sometimes holes in our heart. Without doubt, we could all use some help, someone to provide for and protect us, someone to go with us into battle and hold on to us when times are hard. But the real question is this, are we willing to trust Jesus as more than a helper, more than a hero? Are we willing to say, Lord Jesus, 
Your kingdom come. Your will be done in my life as it is in heaven. That's a huge ask. And you may be th saying, I hear all that and, and I'm, I'm giving it some thought, but I don't know what that would mean in my life and I definitely don't know how to do it. Well, there are lots of ways of entering into relationship with Jesus. But I wonder if you would permit me to make one suggestion. Honoring Jesus as king means coming down off your personal throne. So, why not start by doing with your body what is called for in your spirit? Sometime later today, in a quiet and private place, you might try this. Kneel down. Bow your head. Quiet your body. And listen for the spirit of Jesus from that posture. You might be surprised. As we enter into this holy weekend, whether or not we have yet received him, Jesus Christ is King, creator, sustainer, and redeemer of all that is, seen and unseen. He died for us. He lives for us. We are his. And if we will have him, he is ours. Chapter 1, verse 29. Chapter 19, verse 16 through 22. John the Baptist saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So they took Jesus and he went out bearing his own 
cross to the place called the place of a skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, and Jesus between them. Pilato also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It reads, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Aramaic, in Latin, and in Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilato, Do not write the King of the Jews, but rather, this man said, I am King of the Jews. Pilato answered, What I have written, I have written. Who is Jesus? Who is he really? By now you've probably noticed that the main theme in all of our meditations tonight is this word, behold. Behold the man. Behold the king. And in this passage we just read, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The word behold means more than just casually seeing something. It means gazing upon it. It means taking in its fullness. John, the gospel writer's goal for us is that we would see Jesus for who he really is. And, and the identity of Jesus has always been contested. People say different things about Jesus. Probably one of the most common things you hear people say about Jesus today is that he was a great moral teacher, and especially that he emphasized caring for the poor, the oppressed, and the marginalized. In other words, Jesus was a great human being possibly the greatest who ever lived, but still just a human being. The identity of Jesus has always been contested. So even when he walked the earth, people said different things about Jesus. But he asked his disciples, what about you? Who do you say that I am? Jesus wanted them to behold him. And he wants the same thing for us too. Behold the man means Behold the ultimate representative of everything humanity is meant to be. Behold the king means behold the creator of the cosmos, the true king we all long for to bring healing and renewal to the world. We need all of these different images to show us the fullness of who Jesus really is. But the image that's most challenging, but also most beautiful and healing, is this image of Jesus as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That is a challenging image for us because sin is a challenging concept. We don't really use that word very much except perhaps to describe something naughty like, ooh, that chocolate souffle was sinfully delicious. We would never use that word to describe another human being to, because to call someone a sinner is considered offensive. It's an assault on their dignity. And we would also never use that word about ourselves because it goes against our cultural narrative that we should never demean ourselves but always affirm ourselves because the most important thing is to feel good about yourself. But that means we have a problem because none of us is the person we know we ought to be. We've all done things, selfish things, hateful things, cruel things, prideful things, ugly things. And because of that, we all have an experience of guilt and sin. Our culture would say, well, you just got to put away your guilty conscience. It's just a hangover from a superstitious religious past. It's a neurosis to be cured, not a sin to be forgiven, but it's just not that easy. David Brooks wrote an essay in the New York Times a few years ago. He says that for many years, modern secular society really looked like it was headed more and more towards what he calls a culture of easygoing relativism. We'd all become blandly non-judgmental, sort of chill, pluralistic versions of Snoop Dogg, you do you and I'll do me and we'll all be cool about it, whatever feels right. But it didn't work out that way. Notice our culture of moral outrage. Notice our demands for justice in this world. Notice the ways that we signal our virtue and righteousness on social media. David Brooks goes on to say that we're driven by an inextinguishable need to feel morally justified, and yet we have no clear framework for goodness. Worse, people have a sense of guilt and sin, 
but no longer a sense that they live in a loving universe marked by divine mercy, grace, and forgiveness. There is sin, but no formula for redemption. The reality is that no matter how hard we try to put away our experience of guilt and sin, nothing ever seems to work. Certainly, none of the remedies of modern secularism, our science, our technology, our politics, our wellness regimens. To behold Jesus as the Lamb of God means to behold our need for someone to put away our guilt and sin. To our ears, that sounds primitive and foolish, and yet our need for that never goes away. Do you ever feel your need for it? Does it ever catch you off guard? haunting you in the middle of the night, surprising you while you're washing the dishes? Again, this is challenging for us, especially because we have a tendency to divide the world between the good people and the bad people. You know, in our culture, we resist binaries. We say binaries are bad, but this is one binary we cling to, the good people and the bad people. And of course, we put ourselves in the good category. But this is where this image of Jesus as the Lamb of God kind of gets in our face because this imagery of the lamb comes to us from the Passover story. If you're not familiar with it, Passover is the story of how God calls Israel, uh, I mean Moses, to deliver Israel out of slavery in Egypt. But Pharaoh, king of Egypt, won't let them go. So God tells Moses, I'm going to send an angel of destruction at midnight who will strike down all the firstborn in the land. God is promising to bring down judgment on the oppressors, to bring down judgment on injustice. And we like that. We say, yes, there should be justice, especially on the bad people, especially on the oppressors. But here's the thing that's so unsettling about the Passover story. When God brings judgment down, does he tell Israel, okay, guys, just stand back and watch this? No. He says, Israel, you need to take a lamb slaughter it, and then smear its blood on the doorpost of your house. When my judgment comes down, when I see the blood on your doorpost, my judgment will pass over you. That's why it's called Passover. Unless Israel took shelter under the blood of a sacrificial lamb, they would have been just as liable to judgment as Egypt. Do you see why this is so unsettling? It's messing with our binary. It's saying that we're all liable to judgment because we all have the same capacity for sin and evil in our lives. When God withholds judgment on Israel because of the blood of a lamb, he's passing over the sin and evil in their lives. But when we divide the world into the good people and the bad people and then put ourselves in the good category, you know what we're doing? We're passing over ourselves. There is nothing more spiritually dangerous than that. The idea that we could put away our own guilt and sin by ourselves, that's a very religious idea, but it's not the gospel. Traditional religion says if you work really hard, if you're a good person, then you can atone for yourself. You can achieve salvation. But all that does is produce self-righteous, prideful, hypocritical, judgmental, legalistic people. Some of you probably are done with church precisely because of that. Friends, we can't achieve our salvation. We can only receive it by grace. We can never atone for ourselves. We need to take shelter under the blood of a lamb. That's the gospel. And friends, the historical reality is that Jesus Christ is the ultimate lamb of God. He is the true lamb of which the Passover lamb was simply a a signpost or a pointer because on the cross, Jesus Christ was slaughtered. His blood was poured out. Jesus Christ is the ultimate firstborn, the one and only son of God who took all the judgment and justice that we deserve in order that God could pass over the sin, guilt, and evil in our lives. So that Isaiah 53 could say that Jesus is like a lamb led to the slaughter and that by oppression and judgment, he was taken away. But because Jesus was taken away, all of our guilt and sin was taken away with him. We can't do that for ourselves. We need Jesus to do it for us. Perhaps one of the most moving pictures of that is a story from C.S. Lewis's Chronicles of Narnia. It's about a little boy named Eustace. Through his greed and selfishness, he turns into a dragon. But one night, Aslan, the lion, who's really Jesus, 
uh, leads Eustace to a pool in the middle of a garden high upon a mountain. When Eustace sees the pool, he can't wait to get into the water to ease all the aches and pains of his dragonish body. But Aslan tells him, you'll have to undress yourself first. So Eustace peels the dragon skin off and he's just about to get in the water when he sees there's another dragon skin underneath. So he peels that one off only to see that there's another deeper dragon skin underneath that one. He's about to give up all hope when Aslan says, you'll have to let me do it for you. And so Eustace does. He says, the first tear went in so deep that I thought it had gone straight into my heart. And when he started peeling off the skin, I never felt anything that hurt worse than that. Well, he peeled the beastly stuff right off, just as I thought I'd done it myself all those other times, only they hadn't hurt. And there it was, lying on the grass, only ever so much thicker and darker and more knobbly looking than the others had been. And then he threw me in the pool. It smarted like anything, but only for a moment. And then I saw that I had become a boy again. Dear ones, do you know that we can't take the dragon skin off of ourselves? We can't pass over ourselves. We need Jesus to do it for us. We need Jesus to get into our hearts with his claws and go deep, way deeper than we're able to go, far deeper than we would ever dare to go. Are you able to acknowledge your need for that? There is nothing more challenging than that. But friends, if we let it happen, there's nothing more beautiful and healing than that. If you're exploring faith tonight, are you willing to explore the possibility that your experience of guilt and sin is not an imaginary neurosis, but real, and that you need Jesus to take it away for you? Will you let him do that? And if you are a follower of Jesus, do you know that there are always dragon skins that are deeper in our lives and that we never stop needing Jesus to go deep in our heart, deep in our lives, and continue dealing with the dragon skins, the guilt and the sin in our lives? Dear ones, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world by being taken away for us. Amen. What does the cross of Jesus mean? It's more than songs we sing. So much more than that emblem on your chain.
had a meaningful experience with us this evening. Especially I pray that the love and power of Jesus would grow more and more in your hearts and lives and transform you more and more into a vessel of his love and power to the world around you. We can't do that of ourselves. We need his presence. We need his power. So let me offer you now God's blessing from his word and in his name. May God, who said, let light shine in darkness, make his light to shine in your hearts, to give you the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, Amen. Go in peace.